Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and good morning. My name is Brett Swanson, pastor of Wauwatosa Presbyterian Church, and I welcome you to our Commitment Sunday celebration, an annual rejoicing in the, of thanksgiving for the gratitude, for the generosity that comes from members of this church, both far and wide, just like our worship. People join us from wherever. And so we are thankful that you are here to tell and rejoice in the story of those who partner with this congregation financially, but more so with their whole selves. Everyone is welcome as to be a part of this ministry. Everyone is welcome in worship as well. That has been our commitment since the very beginning. And so friends, no matter where you're coming from today, we are glad that you are here. And a special welcome to those who are worshiping with us by phone. You know, you can call. 414-253-8521 to hear an audio version of this exact service available to you over the phone. I hope you will, and I hope you'll share that feature too. You know, I come today from one of Wauwatosa's most beautiful parks in this most beautiful day, 70s in November, truly a little gift to us all. There's lots of ways that we give gifts to one another and lots of ways that we can rejoice in the beauty that is around us, including the beauty that is us being better together. And so, as initiative of the deacons, today is our very first virtual coffee hour, taking place at 10 a.m. A good morning and Godspeed to all of you who are joining us there. You've been joining us for our online Bible study as well, taking place at Wednesdays at 10 a.m. We've been exploring those who make life's journey better. And so today, uh, I tell you that next week, actually today, I'll tell you that we'll be studying Timothy going forward, who is a bit of a protege, who Apostle Paul hands off the reins of ministry to, who can take us to the next step. I want to rejoice and just with great glad hearts tell you about a good friend of mine, Reverend Mihi Kim Court, who is a co-pastor at First Presbyterian Church, Annapolis, Maryland, who will be leading us in worship next week as we consider the final hidden figure of our series. And that is the one who is left unnamed. She will lead us in this reflection, and I'm glad that she is going to be with us. She is a national leader in our denomination and even the larger Christian universe in expanding our understanding of what it means to be together and the blessings that come with diversity. So I hope you'll tune in next week, November 15th, for worship led by Reverend Kim Mihi Kim Court. And then finally, I want to draw your attention to a special moment here in our welcome and our announcements about the alternative Christmas market that's going virtual this year. Fall has arrived, and what does it mean to you and your family? It represents a season of change, certainly change. And 2020 has represented a huge amount of change for us. So the mission committee has developed uh, uh, you probably can guess it. It's, it's, we, we have virtual everything, right? Now we're going to have a virtual alternative Christmas. And, and it, it's, it's thanks to the office staff and, and uh, the uh, creative thinking of the mission committee. Uh, you'll be able to go to the website of the, the, of the uh, church and be able to uh, see all of the various organizations that we represent and, and that, that we typically would invite to uh, a fellowship hall and uh, click on that button and go to that organization and there in many cases there'll be a video there explaining uh, that the organization will explain what they're doing and what's new with them and uh, it's 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 an, it's an opportunity for that exchange to take place I, I just can't emphasize it enough that it's really paramount that uh, uh, we uh, take this opportunity to participate and and show our generosity to these organizations. It's uh, uh, what, what uh, uh, we need to do. <laughs>
Join us for the prayer of the day. O God of life, there is much that deals in doubt and despair and death in our world. We are often tempted to succumb to these forces. Help us always choose life, to affirm what it can be affirmed, to hope where hope is possible, and to risk ourselves for something greater. For we pray in the name of Christ, who is the way and the truth and the life. Amen. Hey friends, today is Commitment Sunday, as you heard. Commitment Sunday for this community of faith. And under normal circumstances, I would not be here in this beautiful park on this beautiful day celebrating with you. Under normal circumstances, we would be dedicating together in our sanctuary the commitments of the next year and gathering to share a slice of pie and a cup of coffee as the community of faith, as this family of faith. Normal circumstances, we'd be all together, but... Gosh, as you know, and look around, as you know, this year is a bit of a unicorn. Do you know what I mean? Calling something a unicorn? Now, of course, a unicorn is a mythical creature, of course. In other words, it's a, it doesn't really exist. So calling something a unicorn is to say that whatever it is is so rare that it's to barely be believed. So this year, 2020, is just simply barely believable. It's a unicorn aberration. It's nearly mythical on how just upside down all of this really is. And so in the midst of the unicorn nature of all of this, in the midst of all the upside downness, I'm happy to report that this Sunday, today, is just simply the very opposite of that. Read the story from cover to cover and there isn't a single unicorn to be found anywhere on this Sunday. Nobody is doing anything mythical, anything barely believable, anything otherworldly. So much so that we doubt it take place. None of that. Today's story is comforting. 
because in so often this year, there's just a unicorn stampede on every other day. I mean, come on, look, it's November in Wisconsin. It's 70 degrees. I'm filming outside. I'm going to get a sunburn. When there are unicorns everywhere this year, today is a story that we need. Because our hidden figure today is a woman named Abigail who reminds us what fuels our life are not the aberrant unicorns of once in a great while, but what fuels our life are the everyday choices that we make. So today's a good day to talk about making a choice. And no, this is not a thinly veiled attempt to preach an election or voting sermon. Now, in a minute, we're going to hear from Bob Detzer, our liturgist today, who's going to do a great job picking up our story in the 25th chapter of 1 Samuel at the 18th verse. But I wanted to fill in the gaps a bit so you understand what I mean when I say that today is about making choices. David features heavily in this story, but he is not the main character. That's Abigail, our hidden figure. But David is the one day king who now is living his life on the run out in the wild with his Robin Hood style band of merry men. And Robin Hood and his men are out in the wilderness protecting the farms and ranches that dot the landscape in the area from raiders, from opposing armies. David has taken upon this work as for himself keeping the shepherds who bring their herds to graze out there in the wilderness safe and sound. But the day comes for all the sheep to return home. It's going to be the sheep shearing party. And I know that sounds a little strange, a sheep shearing party, but believe me, it's a big deal. So teams of sheep shearers were hired to shear the wool of the some 3,000 sheep that Nabal and his wife Abigail own. At the end of each day, when all the hard work has been done, there would be a party. It would last multiple days for so many sheep. And they'd be eating and drinking. People are getting drunk. And you know what happens when people eat too much and drink too much. They start getting chummy with each other. And all those old stories start coming up. And all those old grudges get remembered. And it turns out that there are exactly four sheep shearing stories. That's fun to say, sheep shearing stories in scripture. These parties, there's four of them. They're mostly connected to David. Three of the four, actually two of the four, I should say. But they all seem to go this way. The sheep come in, the wool comes off, people eat too much, drink too much, and then come these plots for revenge. All four of our sheep shearing stories include these three, food and drink and revenge. Jacob gets revenge on his corrupt father-in-law, Laban. Tamar gets revenge on the family of her late husband. Later on, David's son takes revenge on a man named Ammon. And they just go like that. They just keep going like that. So it's a measure of everyday comfort to see that these sheep shearing stories, even in the midst of what sounds crazy, are playing by familiar rules. Because the story, as I said, is about making a choice. And that's how all this begins. Nabal, the owner of the sheep and who's throwing this big party, is acting like a fool. In fact, his name means fool. David sends some men to the party. David asks to be invited. Nabal doesn't know that David and his merry band of men have been protecting Nabal's shepherds that have made this day happen. This party is possible because of David. But Nabal tells David to just sort off, to borrow a phrase from our friends across the pond. And that's Nabal's choice. He chooses to see himself as a force in and of himself. He refuses to see how we're all interconnected, depending on each other. And then when word makes it back to David, David gets angry. He says, get your swords, boys. We're going to a party. See, one of the traits of these sheep shearing stories is that somebody always runs ahead to tell the most trustworthy person in the plot, and that's Nabal's wife, Abigail. She's our main character for today, in today's story. And so here's what she does, as read to us by Bob. Today's scriptures are from 1 Samuel 25, beginning in 1 verse 18. Then Abigail hurried and took 200 loaves, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, five measures of parched grain, 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of figs. She loaded them on donkeys and said to her young men, Go on ahead of me, I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband, Nabal. 
When Abigail saw David, she hurried and alighted from the donkey and fell before David on her face, bowing to the ground and saying, My Lord, do not take seriously this ill-natured fellow Nabal, for his, as his name is, so is he. Nabal is name, and folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord, whom she was sent. Now this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your servant. David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord and the God of Israel, who sent you to meet me today. Blessed be your good sense. Then to say, David received from her hand what she had brought to him. She said to her, Go up to your house in peace. See, I have heeded your voice and granted your petition. Bob did a wonderful job. Abigail does nothing crazy in this story. She doesn't do anything crazy. She simply sees an issue and then she tries to solve the problem, right? Foolish Nabal says no to the request to for David's men to join the party and Abigail saw a way to fix the problem. She loads up the donkey and sends them out to go see David. And that might've been enough, but Abigail makes a choice. She comes out herself and makes sure that David understands. A way that I want to think about this moment in our story before Abigail presents David with a chance to make a choice, I want to think about this story through that lens of choice. Abigail understands that what we have here in life is that as a choice to see that what we do is never truly independent from who we are. And that's a story that rings true this in every commitment Sunday. We're given our estimates of giving today. And we're humbled and thankful for the giving of this church. But that number, that pledge is never independent from you, from your name, from who you are. Abigail just doesn't see what she has. She sees that the only way to make change happen is by putting herself into this story. Because we might be able to imagine what happens if Abigail just puts the food on the donkeys and sends them down the dusty old road, problem solved, right? But Abigail comes out too. Her presence there shows us something about the everyday nature of this story. That it's all about making the choices we need in order to be the people we want to be. That's what Abigail's speech to David contains. Will David send his men out into Nabal's party and turn it red? Or will David remember that he's destined to become something else, something greater, and make a choice to be the person that God has called him to be? Abigail shows us that life is about choosing a version of ourselves and asking what do we want for the world, our family, our community, and for us? David is given a choice to be a king. Will he be a king who uses his sword to solve a problem or a king who uses his ability to find forgiveness in his heart? Thankfully, Abigail prevails and bloodshed is spared. And so I want to close by exploring in three ways the question, what does Abigail's story actually teach us? And number one, Abigail teaches us that vision for something, something better, will only ever be a half measure without taking action ourselves to see it through. We'll never get over the hump without pairing what we want to happen with what we're willing to do to make it happen. And that brings me to number two. Abigail's story breaks into our lives. It gives us a brief pause. They're on the way to whatever we had planned, whatever we were doing. And that pause gets us to ask the most important question in life. Who am I? David pauses on the road to Nabal's house. And Abigail prov uh, provides for him an opportunity to ask, who am I? Would he be the king with blood on his hands or would he be the one with mercy in his heart? Abigail's story is that forced and sometimes unwelcome pause that interrupts our hot head or our cold heart and gets us to start telling our version of our own story filtered through that idea of who we are and who will we become. And finally, friends, Abigail taking action 
creating that pause in our life is also trying to show us that we all possess the ability to choose. Choice. That's Abigail's legacy. She forced David to choose. But she also invites us to choose. She asks us, will we be generous or not? Will we be grateful or not? Will we be merciful or not? Will we be part of the solution or not? Will we be loving or not? Will we be the person God calls us to be or not? That isn't the work of a unicorn, a barely believable mythical kind of force. That's the work of every day. The everyday Abigails, whose names are so often hidden, whose stories are so often hidden, are the ones who give us that moment to ask, who will we become? And who will we be for the generations to come? Thanks be to God. Amen. Hey friends, uh, we are joined here today by Nancy Bentley, an elder at the church and chair of the Stewardship Committee. And together we want to uh, dedicate these gifts for Commitment Sunday, but also to say thank you to all of the folks who have uh, prayerfully discerned their gift for the coming year. Your generosity has been an inspiration for generations. And so I want to say as we begin this new year with a lot of questions and a lot of uh, anticipation to say thank you. Um, I too, Brett, want to thank everybody for the pledges that have come in already. We're certainly appreciative of everybody who has given gen generously and also offer those that may are still considering. Please do so and send those to the church, uh, either by mail or email. So thank you for those who have given. As usual, WPC has been a phenomenal place to be generous, not only ter in terms of your time and talents, but also we're seeing in the treasures as well. So thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. And so, Nancy, let's uh, come together and with the help of the congregation, do a uh, bit of dedicating to these funds and uh, these uh, partnerships that are being offered this year. So, friends, uh, today is a day of celebration in the life of this church because today we remember that each and every one of us, young and old, is called by God to be a steward of justice, a steward of creation, a steward of peace, and a steward of this family of faith. Scriptures tell us that stewards give from all aspects of their life. As we accept this call to stewardship, we each are becoming a living example of Christ's gospel, proclaiming faith through all that we do and all that we give. 
In 1 Peter, we read, like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. And so to you people of God, I ask you now, do you promise to enter into this covenant together to be God's stewards with all your mind and your heart? If so, together, let's say, I do. I do. I do. Gracious God, you have made a world for us and given us incomparable gifts, air and water, family and friends, your steadfast love and forgiveness, and your son, Jesus the Christ, for all the gifts and wonders you have bestowed on us. We thank you, thank you. and worship you with renewed gratitude. Oh God, you created us to love one another as Christ has loved us. We are concerned about all of your children, those who live near us and those who live far away. We are eager to use our gifts for the work of the church and to further the ministry and service of this congregation. We are here to respond faithfully as we dedicate our lives and resources to the good news of Christ. We are confident in your love and care for us. We, we gladly, gladly give, give back, back to, our, to our gracious God, our, our whole lives, our time, our, time, our, talent, our talents, and our, and our financial resources. Let these symbols of our faith demonstrate our love in our community and throughout the world. Let them reflect a deeper commitment to care for the earth and all of creation as a testament of our love for you. Let them be used faithfully in support of our corporate life together and care for one another and for facilities with which to welcome, share, and pro proclaim your grace. Let them, Let them be symbols of the, love of the love we have received. The justice. The justice we, we will work toward, and, and the, the tender mercy in which, in which you hold us now. now. And so we say, above all, O Lord, receive them as a testimony of our gratitude for the love that sustains us, restores us, and gives life meaning and purpose. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, will you pray with me? Almighty God, you ruled all the peoples of the earth. And so we pray that you will inspire the minds of all women and men whom you have committed to the responsibility now of government and leadership in the nations of this world. Give to them the vision of truth and justice that by their counsel, all nations and peoples may work together. We pray that you will give to the people of our country a zeal for justice and strength of forbearance, that we may use our liberty in accordance with your gracious will. We pray that you will forgive our shortcomings as a nation and purify our hearts to see and love the truth. We remember the diversity of our nation, of our state and our community. For we know that with the news of recent elections that there are those who are heartbroken, people we love. There are those who are related too, O oh Lord. We love them too. We pray for the unity that can come in moments like these and that we reject today, O oh Lord, and the commitment to every day. We reject the spirits of division that seek to whisper into us the, in our ears, telling us that those who disagree with us are our enemies. May this moment of prayer foster in us, O oh Lord, a dedication to what could be. So we claim in this moment to be one where we will choose to act where we all choose to dream and give and plan and to serve one another by loving one another enough not to allow diversity to become division. For today, we pray from the outside in for our world, for our nation, for our state, for our community, for our neighborhood, and for our households. May we be healthy in a time of pandemic May we be just in a time of racism. May we be a people of peace during a time of unrest, and may it be so with one and all. For we bring to you, O God, those who we pray for each and every week, for those experiencing life's transitions and residents of nursing care facilities, 
those who have been affected by illness, our students, medical professionals, and members and friends of this congregation, including Jay Costello, Virginia Doherty, Sandy and CJ Dokestater, Norma Fernhaber, John Freed, Teresa Hosica, Jean Larson, Pauline Kilhefner, Joyce Kolda, John Tag, Dave and Mary Roberts, Faith Rhodes, Jim Schalweger, Roy Wetter, Petra Strife, and the family of Jen Knapp. We also pray for the members of Narcotics Anonymous and other support groups unable to meet during this time. And for those who are incarcerated, and for those prayers submitted to our community prayer box that this week include petitions for those who are anxious regarding the election, the work of the Supreme Court, and for prayers to the end of racism. And so now as God's people who have been taught to pray, let us pray together. Now let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey friends, may the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the example of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, guide your choices in life. This is what knits us together is our ability to think of each other, to love each other, and to ask who and whose we are. We are a body of Christ, individually members of it, and you are an important part of it. Thank you for your love, your commitment, your generosity. Friends, go in God's peace. Amen.